So I'm going to talk about uh, some recommender problems we have been working on at Yahoo. So before I begin, so here is basically what I think of recommender systems. So the goal is to serve the right item. And again, I'll define what right means in the next of the lecture. Right item to users in an automated fashion to optimize some long-term business objective. So, and the automation comes through algorithms, right? And some of which will will be discussed today in the talk. Okay. So before we go ahead, let's look at some examples. So that's probably the best way to uh, demonstrate what we are going to do. So here is an example from content optimization. So this is the Yahoo front page. And again, the goal here is when a user comes to the website, our goal is to recommend articles on this page in different modules to maximize some business objective like uh, overall click-through rate. Uh, sometimes it may even be downstream engagement or even advertising revenue, right? Uh, again, another ad example, online advertising. So a user comes to this publisher page and our goal is to uh, recommend uh, ad ads. So in, this is what is called contextual advertising where the goal is to put ads that are relevant to the context of the page. It could also be display advertising, graphical advertising, uh, as in this case, right? Uh, you know, then you have shopping, so you have people going to Amazon, and maybe this user has already bought something, and once he bought, buys something, puts it into the basket, he comes to another page, and your goal may be to recommend something that's related to what is already in the basket, and further in, increase your revenue, oh, for instance, right? You know, recommend movies, right? So based on what the users have rated in the past, what are the top movies you could recommend? Yet another recommendation problem. The goal here is to make sure the user sticks to Netflix and their subscription go high, right? LinkedIn, again here, you know, you come to LinkedIn and LinkedIn may want to recommend people whom you may know, for instance, based on your social connections. So these are all examples of recommender systems. So if you abstract this out, maybe this is kind of cartoon that we are looking at. So you have users. Users come to some website in some context, right? So the, in the case of advertising, the context could be some publisher page. In the case of the Amazon example, it could include some items which you have already bought. In the case of front page, you may not even have a lot of contextual information. The user just comes to the website. And you have some item inventory. Could be articles, movies, people. And the goal is to construct an automated algorithm that can serve our items to a user, right? And uh, once you serve the items, you get feedback, maybe in the form of clicks, time spent, ratings, buy. You use that feedback to refine the parameters of your algorithm. You repeat this process a large number of times, and at the end of the day, the algorithm should be such that it optimizes some metric of interest, like total clicks and total revenue. So note that the automation ensures that the marginal cost per serve is very low, right? In other words, if you build efficient and intelligent systems, it could provide a huge improvement without too much cost, right? Because of the marginal utility, right? Okay, so here is, a, okay, so how do we build automated algorithm? And one way to do that is to do data mining, right? You mine your data, find, intelligent patterns in your data and then use that to construct clever algorithms that can work in an automated fashion. And so then the thing is, okay, well, you have so much data on the web, uh, maybe it's just enough to process it. Uh, if you can process it and if you can process it fast, maybe it's, a, you know, you apply the usual algorithm, it's all done. So that's not really the case, right? So ideally, when you're doing a recommender system, you want to learn about every user item interaction. That's possible, right? And what happens is the number of things you want to learn in all these systems increases as you get more data. So here is an example from the Yahoo front page. So on the x-axis, I'm showing you the number of data points we are collecting from the system in millions. On the y-axis is the number of users, number of unique users we see in the data. Right? So you can see as you increase the number of data points you collect from the system, the number of users also increases linearly. Right? So the more data you collect, the more things you have to learn. Right? So you never have enough data, right? So the, uh, often these systems are dynamic in nature. The articles change, user behavior change. That further exacerbates the problem. And we also want to learn things quickly so that we can react fast. You know, if there is a Michael Jackson story, you want to react very fast. You don't want to take four hours to uh, realize that this is a, a popular story at this point on the web, right? 
So there is never enough data to learn all we want to learn on the web, right? Okay, so one simple approach that is usually taken is, okay, I have my users and let's say I have my items, right? So these are my users, these are my items. Okay, let's divide the, let's, let's divide the users into a few user segments based on some features, for instance, right? Maybe age, gender, and other features you may have. Uh, and you know, so every user is going to belong to one of these segments. Right, and uh, once you have user segments, small number of user segments, you have a small number of items, you can estimate the CTR of items in each user segment simply by counting clicks and views, right? Very simple approach. So when a new user comes in, you classify the user to one of these segments, and since you already know the CTR of every item in user segment, you serve the most popular item in the segment, right? Very simple approach, right? So let's, let's look at an example where we actually use this approach, right? Just to convince you, it's not a bad approach, but you have to be careful, right? So this is an example application. Right? So this is a Yahoo front page, and you know the Yahoo front page has several modules. So we are going to focus on this module that it's called the Today module. It publishes four different stories on four different positions, and the goal is to recommend the most popular story. Let's say the problem is to recommend the most popular story, right? And let's say, to simplify the problem, our goal is to recommend the most popular story on this slot, which is, the, which is called the F1 slot. And the reason this is an important slot is whatever is shown here is the one that is displayed here, right? So it has very high exposure, right? Okay, so generally what happens here is the article inventory consists of 30 to 40 articles created by editors. Uh, now this article inventory is not static. If there is something breaking happening in the world, the editors are going to refresh these articles and you suddenly get a new set of articles, right? So the half-life of a typical article here is roughly like six to 12 hours, right? So it's a small inventory, but dynamic, right? And we can, we have a system whereby we can collect data every five minutes, right? So now you might be wondering, it's simple, right? You collect data every five minutes on every article, you count, count clicks and count views, compute the CTR, serve the most popular, I and mean, what's, you know, what's, what's so difficult about this? So not quite, right? so I'll, let me show you what happens. So this is what we started uh, as well with, right? So this is our algorithm. This is the first algorithm we started with. We initialized the CTR of every new article to some very high number. And the reason we did initialize this with some very high number is to ensure that a new article gets at least a chance of getting shown, right? If you initialize the low number, maybe the article would never be shown, right? So we initialized it with some high number. Uh, and then what we did was every five minutes, we'll pick the most popular article based on counting clicks and views. If, if there were ties, we'll just randomly break the ties and serve that most popular article on the F1 position for the next five minutes, right? Once we get data after five minutes, we'll again recompute the CTR of every article and do the same thing, right? So we're accumulating clicks, we're accumulating views, and we are just computing the CTR and serving the most popular article, right? So quite intuitive. Uh, um, but it did not work. Uh, the performance was pretty bad, right? So let, let me let me show you why the performance was bad. Okay, so the figures here are a little messed up due to, but this is so this is what the CTR of a typical article looked like, right? So this is an article. It got selected at this point in time, and then the CTRs kept decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. I mean, I don't, I'll tell you why it is decreasing, but. Uh, initially, we did not realize why it was decreasing. So the CTRs kept decreasing, and at this point, it got, it was taken out of the most popular slot and displaced by someone else who became more popular. And then that guy was a popular for a while, and then he got displaced here, and again, this our, our guy comes back, and then again, he gets displaced, and again, he comes back. So this is what the typical CTR of an article looked like. Right? So then we thought, oh, well, for some reason, there is a decay in this CTR profile. Maybe just by accumulating clicks and views, we are not doing a good job. Let's build a dynamic Kalman filter model that can track this decay in a right way, right? And so we build a complicated growth curve model using a Kalman filter, right? And we are very proud of that, right? Very nice, sophisticated model. So the new model was tracking this much better than the old model. But the plot, was, but the performance was still bad, right? So. What's going on, right? Uh, okay, so let me show you what happened here. Okay, so first we said, well, why is this decay happening, right? I mean, we can't just build a model and track it. Maybe we need to understand why is there a decay in the CTR, 
right? why is that happening. Okay, so this plot shows you why the decay was happening. So the decay was happening due to repeat exposure. So what's happening here is people who get exposed to the same article multiple times tend to reduce, uh, the CTR of an article tends to reduce in the user population that gets exposed to the article multiple times. Right? So for instance here, these are people who got exposed to the article the first time. These are people who got exposed to the article third time, fifth time. All these red curves are curves for each single article. So every red curve here represents an article. Right? So you can see this pattern almost for every single article in our system. So user fatigue was causing CTR to decay for each article. Okay. Okay. So maybe this provided some clues to solve the mystery, right? So what what we are seeing here is users seeing seeing an article for the first time tend to have higher CTR. Users who have been exposed to the article previously tend to have lower CTR. But yeah, we are using the same CTR estimates to serve to all the users. Maybe that's not the right thing to do. Right? So maybe we should correct that. So there is a bias in the data, right? And the bias is caused by different user population getting exposed to the articles. And we are kind of computing the popularity using the aggregate data from all these different populations and then serving the same thing for all the users. That's not the right thing to do. But then, then we, were, we started wondering, maybe there are some other sources of bias in the data. I mean, why should we expect there's just one source of bias? I mean, this is something which we were able to detect. What about the other sources of bias? So then the question was, okay, let's try and dig into the system, try to build a fancy statistical model that can adjust for all the sources of bias in the data, and then we'll do it. Okay, but it turned out we did not do that, and I think we are happy we did not do that. So okay, let's, let's go back to the literature, maybe 1800s. Uh, so there's a concept called randomization in the literature, which is used to handle bias, right? So simple idea. So what we did was we created a small user population and in this user population, so this small user population was selected randomly. In this user population, for every single visit, we'll select an article at random and serve it. Right? So there was no serving bias in this population at all. Whatever CTR estimates we got in this population were unbiased. And by just doing this simple engineering solution, we were able to avoid building all the complex statistical models that will remove all possible biases in the data. Right? And again, this randomization is not a new idea. You know, it was proposed first in 1877 by Charles Pierce, and then Ronald, Sir Ronald Fisher popularized it in the 1935s through his book on experimental design. So it's a well-known thing. Uh, there are some other observations which we made from the first experiment. First, sticking with an article for a complete five minutes was degrading performance. Why? So this was this winner-take-all strategy. Once we select the winner, we stick with it. And many bad articles got displayed in multiple times, right? And reaction times to good selecting good articles were also slower, right? So that those were some other observations, right? So once we did the randomization, this is what the CTR looks like, right? So this is the CTR of the same article in the serving bucket where there is all sorts of bias. This is the CTR of the same article in the randomized bucket where you randomly select an article for each user visit. So every article is guaranteed to get some observation. Right? Look at the CTRs. I mean, this and this. There's no, this, is the, this is the true popularity of an article. This is, this is a popularity of an article confounded by different sources of bias in the data. Right? So obviously using this is going to give you pretty bad estimates, and your serving would not be good. Right? Um, okay. So I'm now showing you the CTR of article, different articles in the random bucket which we created, right? So these are all unbiased CTR estimate, popularity estimates, if you will. But surprisingly, the CTRs are still not flat. I mean, there are still some temporal variations in the CTR. So still counting views and clicks would not work. You still have to track this dynamic behavior of the CTRs, okay? But that's not hard because you know if you can build a complicated growth curve Kalman filter model, you can certainly build a Kalman filter to handle this, right? So it was not too bad. Um, okay. So this is the new algorithm, right? Create a small random bucket which selects one out of k existing articles at random for each user visit. This is what I'm calling the random bucket. Okay. And then using that, learn unbiased article popularity by tracking the CTR through a nonlinear Kalman filter. I'm not going to show you the algorithm today, but I'm going to show you some performance of this algorithm, right? So 
you know, these are the empirical CTRs of different articles and this is how the Kalman filter was tracking these CTRs. Uh, so one good thing about this nonlinear Kalman filter is it's more adaptive for articles that have higher CTRs. If you have articles that have higher CTRs, you get, tend to get more clicks in a smaller time window, so you could afford to be more adaptive, right? Because your variance is lower. So if your variance is lower because you get a lot of clicks, you can use a smaller window and you could be more adaptive. If you have an article with very low CTRs, you need more clicks, so you cannot be very adaptive. Otherwise, the variance is going to kill you, right? So it's better to be biased, but not let the variance kill you, okay? And that's what you're seeing here. So for instance, this red curve, this is an article with a higher CTR. Don't believe in those numbers, I've scaled them. Uh, but yeah, this is an article with a higher CTR. And you can see that the Kalman filter is more adaptive for this one than this one, okay? So you can read about the Kalman filter algorithm in one of our papers, but that's essentially the idea here. Okay, and once you learn the article popularity by using the Kalman filter, you serve the most popular article in the serving bucket. And we also had some business rules, like don't show an article to a user if he has been exposed to it for two or three times. We also had diversity rules, don't show five sports articles at the same time, that's common. Uh, voice rules, so you, we don't want Yahoo to become a Hollywood gossip site, right? So we made sure that there is a good balance of articles that were shown to the user. So uh, subject to these constraints, if you do, this is what the algorithm was doing, okay? Is that clear? Okay, so the other advantages, so the random bucket had other advantages as well. First, it ensured a continuous flow of data on all articles, right? Because we were randomizing, we were guaranteed to get data on every single article that got programmed into the system immediately. Okay, there was no delay. And so this enabled us to quickly discard bad articles and convert to the best one, right? And this saved the day. I mean, if you had gone with the earlier algorithm, the project would have been yanked, but this was success. The initial click lift was initially, immediately we got a 40% click lift. You can get more details on this paper here, and now after three years, it's fully deployed, and all that, right? So it's all nice. Okay, so what did we learn from this experiment? Let's try to abstract and see what we learned from this, okay? Okay, so you can get more details here. I'm not going to, so lessons learned, okay? So it's okay to have simple models, right? I mean, I think we all know, I mean, when you're working with production systems, you cannot just get data and start building the most complex model in the world, right? I mean, it takes time to build complex models. So. It's okay to start with simple models that learn a few things, but beware of the biases inherent in your data. Don't get fooled by the bias inherent in your data. So some example of things gone wrong, right? Uh, suppose you're learning article popularity, right? You use the data from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. PST to learn the article popularity, and then you serve the article according to that estimate from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. This can be very bad if the article is popular on the East Coast and not popular on the West Coast, right? So you have to be careful of these things. Uh, otherwise, you know, simple models are fine, but it can kill you, right? And randomization is your friend, right? So use it when you can. It's always good to have randomization, some randomization. Update your models fast. And why is that so? Because that may reduce the bias. Generally, user visit patterns that are close in time tend to be similar. So if you update your models very fast by using some kind of a moving window, then you're less likely to be affected by bias. If you kind of update in the morning and serve at night, who knows? Uh, right? If you're lucky, you'll be fine, but there's no guarantee that you'll be fine, okay? Okay, so what if you can't afford to do complete randomization as I described, right? So then I think you have to learn how to gamble. And uh, okay, let me tell you a bit about gambling. Uh, I can't cover the whole thing, but it's a good idea to learn how to gamble, right? So uh, here is why you need how to learn. So consider this problem, right? So consider there are two slot machines, right? So you have, you have a slot machine with two arms in a casino, right? And you know, this is the first machine, this is the second machine. The payoff of this machine is P1, the payoff of this machine is P2. We know P1 is bigger than P2, so that's the ground truth, but when you actually are playing in the casino, you have no idea which machine is better, right? Uh, so there are some unknown payoff probabilities. And let's say as a gambler, you get 1,000 times. You, you can only play 1,000 times. That's, that's the amount of budget you have. 
what is the best way you can play these machines to maximize your reward? Right? So if you, if you know the problem, don't say anything. If you don't know the problem, if this is the first time you're looking at the problem, I'll, I'll give you 10 seconds to think how you'll do it. This, let's say you're in a casino and you want to do this. What's the best way to play these machines a thousand times to maximize your reward? Right. So any idea? That's a reasonable algorithm, right? So you kind of do some randomization initially, and then you figure out what's a good, good arm, and then you stick with that, right? So that's a good algorithm. Uh, it's not the optimum, right? So this, this problem is called the bandit problem, and it has been studied for a long time. And the solution is very complex, so I was not expecting you to come up with an answer in 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> it took like 20 years before people came up with a good solution to this problem, right? OK, so in fact, it's so complex that I can't even describe it in this talk. But I'm going to give you an intuitive idea of what the optimal solution is. Okay? So the optimal solution is you start playing. At any given point in time, you play the arm that has the maximum potential of being good. So rather than playing the arm that has the maximum mean estimate, play the arm that has the maximum potential. How do you measure the potential of an arm? Maybe you can do something like mean plus uncertainty estimate. Right? Okay, so this guy has a mean of 5%. but the mean can actually go as high as 9% based on my statistical variability. Right? This is called uh, being optimistic in the face of uncertainty. It does not always apply to other things in life, but here it does. Right? So be, be optimistic in the face of uncertainty. Right? And that, that's what it is. Now, there are many formulas to compute what the potential is of an arm. And you can go through the literature. There are like 200 papers on that. Uh, but, but that's the main idea here. Okay? OK, so now are the recommender problem bandits or not? Right? Well, let's see. So it's kind of a bandit. So let's look at a simple example. Right? So two items, let's say item one have been shown 100 times and you got two clicks. Item two was shown 10,000 times and you got 250 clicks. Right? So what would a greedy solution tell you? OK, well, the empirical CTR of this guy is bigger than this, so I'm just going to stick with that. Just discard this guy. That's not a good idea. On a good day, this guy would have gotten four clicks, maybe. Right? It got two today. Tomorrow, it might get four. So you're getting fooled by statistical uncertainty here. Maybe. Or maybe not. Maybe. Right? So that's not a good idea. So the, a, good, a better idea would be to invest in item one until you're absolutely sure that it's worse than item two with a high degree of confidence. Because until then, you should stick to them. Maybe this, uh, this article is the Michael Jackson article, and maybe the first 100 users were not Michael Jackson fans. Maybe they came from some other remote part of the world where they've never heard of music, right? So, but very soon, you're going to get a lot of hits on this, right? So if you discard this, you actually discard showing Michael Jackson on Yahoo front page, which could be a pretty de devastating experience for users on Yahoo, right? So, this is not a good idea, right? And you know, if you, look, if you draw a picture, you can clearly see this. So let's say this is article two. Uh, so let's assume you know the CTR of this article because you, know, you had 10,000 plays, right? So 10,000 plays is good enough. There is no statistical uncertainty. But this guy, since it has only 100 plays, there is a statistical uncertainty in the CTR estimate, right? So there is a probability that this article could be better than this article, right? And until you, so until this curve moves completely to the left or completely to the right, you should keep playing this article a certain number of times. I'm not saying all the time, but a certain number of times. You should invest some amount in playing this article. Now, what is the optimal amount is something which you have to obtain from a mathematical programming, right? So you have to write down the optimization problem and get a solution. But this is just an intuitive idea. You should invest some, some displays on article one as well, right? And again, this is also called the explore exploit problem. If you are, if you've heard the buzzword, right? So exploit what is known to be good, explore what is potentially good, right? So that's why it's called explore exploit. Okay. Okay. So again, I'm not going to go through the mathematics of a Bayes optimal solution for this problem, but I'm just going to show you a picture which kind of tells you how the Bayes optimal solution looks like. It's a bit surprising. Uh, you'll see that. Right, so on the x-axis, we have the uncertainty in the CTR of the first article. Right? Remember the one article I showed you that had very good CTR. There was no uncertainty. Right? On the x-axis is the uncertainty in CTR. And 
I'm quantifying the uncertainty in terms of the number of pseudo views that article would have, right? So 1,000 views would mean that we are less uncertain about that article. Uh, 10 views would mean you're more uncertain about that article. On the right axis, I'm told, uh, is the optimal allocation to that article in the next five minutes, right? So what fraction of the users in the next five minutes should be shown this article, right? So what, that's the, what the optimal allocation scheme for that article. So before I show you the curve, any idea what the curve would look like? Anyone who gets this right, uh, I'll buy a beer. <laughs> so intuitively, you know, you will think that if you're very uncertain, you should explore more until you become certain, and then it should go down. Um, but the curve is very different. So what it says is, if you're very, very uncertain, then be a bit cautious. Don't explore too much. But beyond a certain point, you start exploring a lot, and, immediate, and after that, you know, of course, you know, when you have a lot of data, then you know this article is worse than the article when you don't, don't show that. And so the reason that's happening is because the articles have finite lifetime, right? If every article had infinite lifetime, then this bump here would not appear. It will look like a monotone curve. But because we know the lifetime of an article is six hours and 12 hours, and you are so uncertain, the algorithms say, well, in six hours, with that kind of uncertainty, I can't learn anything. Right, so I'm going to be cautious initially. Get me, let me, let me get some data, and then I'm going to become more optimistic. Right, so that's why you see this curve. Uh, say that again. Sorry, I missed that. Zero percent. Okay. Hmm? It depends on how many how many views you have in the data, right? So it does not always depend on the mean. It also depends on the uncertainty in your estimate. So if the click rate is 0%, but based on only 10 views, then that's a very different story compared to a situation where you have 0%, but based on 1 million views, right? So 1 million views and 0%, you're pretty much sure this is a nonsense article, right? But you know, 0% with 10 views, it could be very different. Then the curve may start looking like this, yes. This is not the whole story, right? In the actual system, you know, I'm going to give you k articles, and then you have to derive a solution for k articles. So I'm going to sh I, I, uh, here I'm showing you a solution for a very simplified scenario, where one article is completely known, the others are not known. Uh, if you want to know the complete solution, then you have to read the paper. It's pretty complex. So you know, it might take two hours to go through that. So I had a one-hour talk, so I can't go through that. Uh, OK, so you can look at this paper if you want more details about the solution, the Bayes optimal solution to this problem. Okay. okay. Uh, so now, okay. Now I'm claiming recommender systems are bandits, but not one single bandit. It's like a large number of bandits in a casino, right? Almost like a multi-armed mafia problem, if you like the term, right? So you can think of the items as arms of bandits, and the ratings and CTRs as unknown payoffs. And the goal is to converge to the best CTR item as quickly as possible. So if you do that, this is fine, but it assumes that all size fits, one size fits all, right? So no personalization. Once you start getting into personalization, then you can think of every user as a separate bandit. So you have hundreds and millions of, at least at Yahoo, we have hundreds. I don't know about other startups, but at Yahoo, we have hundreds of millions of bandits. So you can think of this as a huge casino, right? Every guy is a bandit, and we have to converge on that, right? It's a large bandit. Right. So again, how to do that? Rich literature. Um, uh, you can look at uh, some tutorials. I think there was a tutorial this year at ICML. There were some tutorials last year at KDD. So you can, if you really want to get into this area, uh, you can look at those tutorials. I think that's a good start. But broadly speaking, if you don't want to spend time looking into the technical details, uh, it's a clever or adaptive way of doing randomization. Rather than doing complete randomization, you do a clever uh, randomization. You, you adapt your randomization as you move over time, right? If suddenly you find this article is really bad, then you don't give anything to that article anymore. If you do a complete randomization, you'll always keep giving views to articles, even if you know that they're bad, right? So it's a more adaptive randomization. So the random bucket solution I described is a, is a solution to this problem. So you can describe that solution as follows. With probability 1%, I randomly select an article and serve to the user with probability one minus epsilon. I serve the best possible article according to my model, right? So that's called epsilon greedy in the literature. So that's that is a solution to this particular problem. It's not the most efficient solution, but it is a solution to this problem as well. 
Okay. So, what we did earlier was a solution in this literature, it was not something which we cooked up. Okay. Okay. So, so, this was about learning simple models and biases and randomization. Now, let us come back to the number of things we want to learn, right. So, remember we talked about the number of things we have to learn on web data, right. The more data, the more things we want to learn, right. Or rather, this is also called curse of dimensionality in the scientific community, okay. So, what are the pros of learning things at a more granular resolution rather than learning things at a coarser resolution, right. So, first of all, you get better estimates of affinities at the event level. So, for instance, you can make statements like add 77 as high CTR on publisher 88 if you use a very granular model. If you are using a coarser model, you might be only able to say add 77 has good CTR on the sports publisher. You may not be able to go that granular and uh, you know if you do not do that, sometimes it can affect your serving, can affect your systems very badly, right, okay. If you go very granular, then the bias problem becomes less problematic, right, because you are so, this is the general principle, right. You know, if you do not get the other technical details, if you just get this, I think, uh, you know, I will be happy coming to the talk here. So, the more we chop, the more we chop the data, the less prone we are to aggregating dissimilar things, right, and the less biased our estimates. Right? But it comes at a price. The more we chop, the more variance also you get, right. The more we chop, the data starts evaporating as well. So, there is no free lunch here, okay. Okay, so what is the challenge then? So then there, there must be some challenges of learning granular models. Otherwise, everybody should be doing that, right? Too much sparsity, right? The more we chop, the data evaporates. Sometimes we don't have that much traffic. For instance, many ads are not even shown on many publishers, right? So how do you know how they are going to do on those publishers, right? You can do explore, exploit, or the casino thing which I talked about earlier to mitigate some of this. Uh, but, you know, these are very high dimensional problems. You have to do a lot of experimentation. It is very costly, so you cannot do that. Even with clever randomization, you cannot afford to do that in many systems because of the dimensionality. Like in advertising, the response rates are abysmal, right? So, this is even a worse problem there, okay? Okay, so the solution is keep, go granular. Go as much granular as you can, but as soon as you find there is no data, just back off, right, back off to a higher resolution. Go granular, but back off. Whenever there is a need, just back off. Okay, I do not have enough data, let me back off to something more use, more, more meaningful, right. So, I will show you an example here. Again, this is, a, this is a toy example, but it may convey the idea, right. So, just let us look at this, publisher ID 8877 zip Palo Alto, right. You, you showed this ad five, five times and you got zero clicks. So, what is the click rate? Zero, I mean, it is not zero. It's okay, well, I have very little data. Okay, let me see, maybe, maybe, maybe this could be a good prior estimate, okay, I have very little data here, but if I just look at the overall click rate of publisher ID on advertiser 9, maybe that is a good fallback estimate if I do not have enough data, or maybe just Palo Alto in general is not bad, or maybe just the global advertiser ID is not bad, right. So, these are different possibilities of backing off, and you know, ideally you may just even want something like this, right. So, I want the CTR estimate at this to be a weighted average of all these different backups, and the weights should be automatically determined by some algorithm to give me the optimal bias variance trade-off, right. That is the kind of thing you want here, okay. So, so this is, this is, this is better. Right? If you can do that, it is better. It takes more care. You have to hire experts to do it. It is not a job promotion, but yeah, you need experts to do this. It is not, it is not automated all the time because every different data set is very different. You have to really understand the problem before. Going granular is not very easy, right. You have to build regularization as it is called or back off. Otherwise, you will be killed. If you just do the kitchen sink approach, kitchen sink approach is take whatever I have, put it into an algorithm, let it do what it wants, it will never work. Well, never is a very strong word, but it will not work in most cases, right. So, you have to be careful when you build granular models, right. So, here is another example. So, the same kind of situation, but now you have a lot of data here. There is no need to back off. I mean, you have shown this, this, uh, you have shown this ad like, a, you know, a lot of times and, you know, so that's, that's where there is no need to back off at all. This data is sufficient to kind of inform you of what is going on here, right. So, back off when you need to back off, otherwise do not back off, right. Then this gives you the best of both worlds. Okay. And, you know, if there are some regions where you have no data and you really feel you need data there to make a good, to do a good job, do explore, exploit, right, and just fill up the space, right. So, that is really the kind of approach you are taking. So, now the question is, well, I have so many ancestors, 
when I'm backing off, how do I borrow? How should I be borrowing from different ancestors, right? So that's a legitimate question. So it depends on the heterogeneity in CTRs of small cells, right? So here is an example. Let's say, uh, let's say you know, this is the Bay Area, and now you are looking at the CTR of you know, Los Gatos, Palo Alto, Mountain View. You know, let's say there is no data here. Then is it a good idea to back off to the estimate of the Bay Area? That will depend on how homogeneous these CTRs are. If different zip codes in Bay Area have dramatically different CTRs, then it's not a good idea to back off to the Bay Area estimate when you have lack of data. You should back off to something else where the CTRs are more homogeneous. Right? So that's the basic principle. I'm not describing an algorithm here. I'm just describing the principle. Okay. Okay. So, but now, how do you obtain these groupings to back off? Right. Uh, it's not very easy, right? Because you have billions or trillions of possible attribute combinations. How do you discover what's the right grouping structure to use uh, for backing off, right? So, I'm not going to attempt to solve this problem completely because it's an NP-hard problem, maybe even P-sharp hard. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give you some examples of how we have solved this problem in some context, right? Uh, but by no means these are the only ways to solve this problem, right? But this is a this is a challenging problem, right? I mean, you have trillions of possible combinations and you want to create groups which can be used for backing off when you have very low, little data at very granular resolution. Right? So that's really the basic problem. Okay, so two examples, right? So one is from online advertising. Okay, so again in online advertising, advertising you have a user coming to a publisher page and then you have some ad networks, uh, you know, advertisers participating through some ad networks, right? And, uh, you know, and the ad network picks up the best ads to show to the user when they're visiting the page, right? So how do you pick up the best ads? So the best ads, again, okay, so advertisers generally have bids, and you know, once you show the ads to the user, they either click on it, and sometimes you also track whether they convert, like or they buy something on the website, and you know, then you have some statistical model, the kind of models I was talking about, that can estimate click rates, conversion rates uh, per ad view. Right? And then you conduct an auction. And the auction is based on some function of bid and the response rate you compute from the statistical model. A simple example is just multiply the bid with the response rate and then select the winner. Right? So this is what's done. You know, uh, you know, nowadays, the ad exchanges are very popular. Right? Media is one ad exchange. So it provides a unified marketplace where publishers and advertisers can come and connect and you know, do business in a unified marketplace. It, improve, it improves the liquidity of the market. It acts as a clearing house for publishers. The advertisers get better ROI and so on. The very good things. All good things happen here, and this is how it works, right? So, for instance, you know, you have a publisher who has an ad impression to sell. You know, he will get several bids, right? Some from networks, some from advertisers. Some, in some cases, there is arbitrage going on through some networks, right? And uh, at the end, the guy who has the maximum bid times the response rate wins the auction, right? Okay, so. So the challenge here is, again, the statistical challenge here is to estimate that function, right? Bid times rate, right? And again, bid is generally known, although nowadays that's also becoming real time. So, but you know, that's, I'm not going to go into that challenge today, but I'm going to focus more on estimating the response rates, right? So this is the problem, right? You, you have some response which you are measuring, conversion clicks, and you, know, you want to estimate the response rate for every single publisher user ad combination, okay? So the number of combinations could be millions or billions or trillions. I mean, there's too, there's too many combinations here, but that, that's the function which you want to estimate by using very sparse data which you obtain from the system, okay? Okay, so again, generally you have features available on publishers, users, ads. In our case, we also had hierarchies, right? So for instance, publishers had URL which were nested within domain, and then we also knew what the publisher type was. We had geo hierarchy on users. We also had ad, ad hierarchies. Ads are organized into campaigns, and campaigns are nested within our, uh, advertisers. It turns out in ap application, this hierarchical grouping actually does provide you homogeneity in CTRs. Right? So this is a very good situation. Someone gave us these groupings from domain knowledge, and we find that actually the data is homogeneous. This is the best you can hope for. Right? And so if it, is, if it is there, why not use it? Right? So that's what I'm going to show how to use it. Okay? So you, know, you have some user features. And you have some publisher features and ad features. Uh, and so the probability of this triplet is a product of, so B is some baseline model which you may build out of some features, right? Ignore that for the moment right now. The main action is going on in this lambda IJs. So these lambda IJs are the corrections which you have to apply at very granular level to mitigate the bias of this coarse level model, right? 
so the trick is learning this model here, right? And you know, so that's called the baseline. Let me call that the residual model, right? And you know, so what what's happening is, so what you can do is you can aggregate the data at the at the publisher and advertiser level. So SIJ is the number of successes you get. EIJ is the expected number of successes you'll get in that cell if you just believed in this baseline model, right? And lambda IJs are the corrections which you want to learn. Now, if this baseline model is really good and unbiased, then the lambda IJs will be all one, and you're done. That never happens, right? So lambda IJs have to be learned at very granular level, okay? And so now if you just say, okay, well, lambda IJ is just SIJ divided by EIJ, that's not going to work because uh, a large number of such cells have zero successes, right? So zero over five and zero over 10 are not all zeros, right? Zero over five is less of a zero than zero over 10, right? So you have to adjust for those effects, right? Okay, so then you can do like a hierarchical smoothing as I was talking about, right? So in this case, you have, uh, let's say, a hierarchy on publishers. Uh, you, know, you have pub ID, and then that's nested within a publisher class. Uh, you have an ad ID, campaign ID, conversion ID, advertiser ID, and that's what you want to learn, right? So the back off model here again, right? So let's say you want to learn the residual for a pair IJ, the back off model. So in this case, you have several neighbors as back off, right? So these are the three neighbors, right? So okay, in order to learn this, I can use this as my back off. That's more coarser. This is my back off. This is as my back off, right? There are others as well, right? So there are like Oh, how many? Seven different backups which you could use in this particular case, right? So seven neighbors, three of them are blues, four of them are greens, right? And you can use all of them and do a weighted average and come up with a good, good, uh, good, uh, you know, good model. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to describe the model here, so you can read that in the paper. But this is the main idea. We, we use all the seven or eight different backups and construct a function of these seven or eight different things and come up with a weighted average to estimate the CTRs. Right, so those weights which I was showing you in the earlier slide, that's all coming through a statistical model. It's complex, uh, but it works well. Uh, so and you can read that in the paper. Okay. Right. So uh, let me show you some results. So again, in this data, the advertisers can participate through different revenue models like CPM, CPC, CPA. And again, in order to conduct the auction, we have to normalize across these different currencies. So that involves estimating click rates, conversion rates, and so on and so forth. Right, so we build a conversion. We build three different models. Right, one for click, two for conversions, uh, and again, I think you can read these slides here. But these, these are the results. Right, so let me show you the results. So this LMMH one C and two C are the variations which I was talking about, and these are the usual logistic regressions that are there in the literature. So you can see, if you utilize the information, grouping information that is given by the advertisers and the publishers from the domain knowledge, you can do much better. I'm not saying this is always available, but if it is available and if you use it carefully, then you can do much better than just traditional kitchen sink models, okay? But that's really the main message here. And again, the details are all in the paper, okay? If you want to know more details, talk to me offline. Okay, so now back to another example. So here I'm going to show you an example where I don't have such domain knowledge, and I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out automatically from the data. No one told me this is the right grouping, okay? So how, how do I do that if no one tells me what's the right grouping? So the front page example, again, uh, recall the problem. You have a user uh, article, user icons. We show articles that we want to know. You know, once you show an article, you either get a click or no click. And uh, by using these observations, you want to estimate the click rates, right? So that's, that's the problem. You can think of this as a bipartite problem, bipartite graph problem. I know there was a talk here on graphs. Uh, last time okay so you know these are your users these are your items and you know some items go get shown to the users and you either observe a click or you don't observe a click right? so this is your incomplete graph and what you really want to do is you want to complete this graph right so you only see a small number of observations in this graph and you want to fill up the edges of the graph right by using the predicted ctr right so given that incomplete graph i want to come up with a model which can give me the edge weight of every possible edge in this pipeline so that's the problem and again, one way to do this is through factor models. So again, I'm going to give you a high level idea of what these factor models are, right? So, okay, let's, let's go back. So uh, these are our users. These are the items, right? And now I want to estimate the CTR of a user when exposed to a given article, right? So, so let's consider a user I and article J, okay? Okay, so this is how the model works. So first, I'm going to associate a parameter called user popularity with every user. 
some user just click more. I don't know why they do that, but some users just click more, uh, right? And uh, some items are more popular, right? So that's item popularity. Right? But then the user popularity and item popularity does not explain affinities of users with items, right? There is something else left out, and that that's the critical part, right? So in order to capture that, what we do is we take a user and map them to some latent Euclidean space, right? So this is the position of a user in this Euclidean space, UI. This is the position of the article in the same Euclidean space. And now what we do is we say, okay, well, the affinity of this user with this item is going to depend on the cosine of the angle, okay? So the goal now is to take the incomplete bipartite graph you observed and estimate the optimal configuration of these things, right? So what is the optimal way of mapping users on items so that I can explain the data in the best possible way without chasing the data? You don't want to learn idiosyncrasies in your data. You want to learn patterns in your data, right? So you should not get too excited just by looking at the training data. You should be careful, right? Because at the end of the day, you want your model to generalize futures, future interaction, right? With that. That's the art of machine learning and statistics, right? So if you are more mathematically inclined, this is what we do, right? We say, okay, CTR of an article I on user J is a function like this, right? So it depends on the item popularity, user popularity, and the cosine of the angle between the latent position of users on item in the space. Okay? Okay, so now how do we do back off here, right? So if we have users and items that have a lot of data, you can estimate those positions very well because, you know, they have come to the front page a lot of times. I know a lot of things about them. I can do that. What if a user comes to the front page once or twice? Then you need to do some back off to estimate their factors, right? If you can't just use one or two interaction to estimate a latent position for that user, right? So this is how the back off works. So imagine a simple scenario where users possess three different attributes. Either you are an old user or a young user. You come from Mountain View or not. You like skiing or not. So this is the backup. You say, okay, well, if I have these three different attributes, there are eight possibilities, right? So you can have eight possible backups depending on who the user is. Now, if you want to learn all the eight possible backups, that's not possible. That's just too many combinations. Imagine I give you 100 attributes, two to the power 100, not possible. So what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to learn the eight possible parameters by doing a projection. I'm going to take a user, look at their three-dimensional vector, I'm going to project it into a linear space and just learn, the, just learn the projection into a linear space rather than learning the whole possibilities, uh, whole possibility of combination, right? So this is what we're doing, right? So given your features, I'm going to learn this projection weights, right? So this is the backup, right? So if I know this, this, and this, these are some, con this, so this is a constant which applies to all, all users, not just this user, right? But I learned this by using the data from all the users and items I have. So at the end of the day, you learn eight possible backups by using only three unknowns, right? And that's a much easier problem to do, right? I'm skipping a lot of details here. You must have noted by now, right? <laughs> it's not, uh, but, but this is the basic idea, right? You have eight possible combination, and you learn the eight backups by using three parameters, using a projection, right? It's just projected onto a linear space. Whenever you take a bit vector and project it into a linear space, you, you can actually express all possibilities by using a small number of parameters. That, that's really the main idea here. That's what regression is all about, right? projecting into a linear subspace. Do you mean that this is a naive algorithm that looks at each one of the inputs separately? No, no, no. This is not a naive algorithm. This is the algorithm. You have to compute this horrendous integral to solve this. Uh, <laughs> it's not a naive algorithm. And that's where all the computation is. Uh, so uh, again, you know, in order to discuss the details, we need time, but it's not a naive algorithm. It has, it's a highly nonlinear algorithm and takes quite a bit of effort to solve this problem. Right. Uh, but it works well. Okay, so I think these fonts are messed up. I'm not going to go through this slide. Uh, okay, so I'm just showing you some examples here, right? So, um, so the red, red curve here is the new model I was talking about. Forget about the black curve for now. Uh, the green and the blues are some models that existed for this problem in the literature before, before we did this work, right? And these are called ROC curves. So higher the curve, better the performance, right? So this is just to convince you that what I talked about is not cartoon and vapor, it's real, <laughs> uh, okay? 
And again, if you want to know more details, you can read this paper. We are doing a lot. So all these models which I described, uh, described they run on Hadoop, scalable to very large data sets. Right? And again, for the factor models I described, we are also doing some additional work on making it even more scalable by using an online algorithm. Right? So this is something which we are doing now, uh, not, not yet published. Okay? Okay, so finally, I think uh, started five minutes later. So I have eight minutes, so I'll try to cover one more topic. Uh, I know that there are a lot of topics here, but I'm just trying to give you a brief overview of all the topics rather than going deep into any one of them. Okay, hope that's okay. Okay, so let's come back to the front page example, right? So now what I'm what I'm going to convince you here is I'm going to try to convince you here is just looking at one objective is not always a good idea, right? Click is not the end of the story. You know, we can actually create a story with very nice links. You know, like Britney Spears images, and uh, you may click on it, but you go to that page and you find the content is not good. So that's not good user experience. So when you're recommending articles, often you may find yourself in a situation where you have multiple competing objectives, right? And one objective is not the whole answer. So how do you do? How, how, what do you do in those situations? So I'm going to give you an example of how we did it, um, but it is more application dependent, right? So here is the front page application and you know there is some recommender algorithm which wants to serve content so let's say you serve content you get a click and the click are on stories which would take you to some other yahoo pages like sports so if there's a sports story it will take you to yahoo sports or yahoo news or omg finance right and if you go to these pages there are some advertisers we show some ads on these pages so there is advertising revenue associated on these pages and there is also downstream engagement right how much time do you spend so now intuitively this is what we're trying to do here. So the usual thing is, okay, try to show articles so that you maximize clicks. The more clicks we get, the more downstream supply we send to our network, the more money we make, make hopefully. You know. Okay, but now consider this scenario, right? So let's say we have an article which has a CTR of 5%, but the utility, the downstream utility is five utils. I'm not telling you what it is, but it could be anything. And let's say there's another article, the CTR is 4.9%, but the utility downstream is 10 utils. So usually you will show this article instead of this. But now if I can lose a small amount of CTR and get a, such a huge improvement in the downstream utility, maybe it's not a bad idea to do that, right? And that's exactly what we're doing here. We are promoting article two. By promoting article two, we lose one in 100 clicks, but we gain five utils. And let's say you are able to do this for a large number of such visits, then you can get something like a Pareto optimal curve like this, right? So you lose 5% CTR, you get 20% improvement in some of the downstream utility which you may care about. It could be revenue, it could be downstream engagement, for instance. Okay? Uh, so again, uh, we call it click shaping. And the reason we call it click shaping is because we are shaping how the clicks go in different parts of Yahoo, right? So this is the pie which you see if you are just optimizing for CTR. This is the pie you see if you optimize for objectives other than CTR. Right. So the pie, the click pie gets smaller because we are losing CTR, but the distribution changes. Right? And again, if it's hard to see on the pie chart, you know, you can see the same thing on the bar chart here, right? So, you know, for instance, you know, we may again I'm not claiming this is real graph, but similar. Uh, Randomize the property names, yeah. Okay, so for instance, you may lose something on, you may lose clicks on news, small amount of clicks on news, but you may get more downstream utility on news. And again, the shaping can happen to other, with respect to other metrics. So if the business thinks there is some other thing which are more important, then, then we can actually do this with respect to that as well. Yeah. Right. So you can write it down as a linear program if you want to do it Right, so you know these are these are the user segments. These are the articles, and then you know the CTRs. Let's say you know the downstream utility. And the optimization problem is to figure out how to allocate articles to different segments to optimize some objective function. Right, so the objective function could be, okay, maximize my downstream utility subject to the condition I don't lose more than five percent of the total clicks which I get now. That could be one objective, for instance. And then you can solve a linear program and get the solution. Right. And you solve that linear program every 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and use that for doing the serving in your system. And, and you'll get these Pareto optimal curves. Now, someone has to look at these Pareto optimal curves. It has to be an executive. 
and then make a make a business decision on what they want to do right so that's where the scientists kind of lose control and the business takes over okay okay so these are some results again i'm not going to discuss this result you can if you want to know more about this research we have a very recent paper in kdd 2011 there are many other nuanced multi objective formulations we have in that paper you may want to look into for instance you know 2 minutes on finance is not the same as 2 minutes on entertainment right if someone spends 2 minutes on finance that's a very that's a much higher engagement than spending 2 minutes on an entertainment side so we have a formulation where we normalize for these effects and then come up with a objective a multi objective formulation that does that right so if you are more interested in this you can read that paper okay okay uh, we can also do this for advertising revenue and actually we are working on this uh, i won't talk about it today uh, but uh, i think we will be able to share the research in the future after after doing due diligence um, okay okay so summary so i talked about a few ideas today so the first one simple models that learn a few parameters are fine to begin with but be aware of the biases in your data right small amounts of randomization plus fast model updates can work wonders if you are able to do those try to do those right if you can't afford simple randomization then you may want to do clever randomization by using explore exploit exploit techniques and there are many methods to do that in the literature you can look into that literature granular models are more effective so if you if you, if you can build granular models you you should do that but you have to make sure you have a inbuilt back off procedure in your models if you just do the kitchen sink approach it may not it may not work very well sometimes it may sometimes it may not uh, so that's something which you have to be careful of when you're doing granular models and often it is uh, important to solve a recommender problem using multiple of, multiple metrics and if you have a situation like that then you know the multi objective optimization framework can come in handy right so these are the four ideas i talked about uh, this is the kind of modeling strategy which we have adopted right so our modeling is kind of composed of three different components one is the offline component so this offline component is based on features uh, it's kind of building models at coarse resolution it captures characteristics of the system that are stable do not change too much over time but obviously we know it is biased right it cannot tell you what ad 77 is going to do on publisher 88 so in order to mitigate the effect of such biases we build online models that correct the biases of this model and we update these models very fast that's very important you have to update it very fast if you delay it then it may not work very well especially in content targeting it may not work very well in advertising sometimes it is fine okay and we always have explore exploit running in the background which can give us data where we actually lack data and we really feel that's important to have data here right because i can see there is a very good ad here and i just don't have data so let's get some data here right so that's what the explore exploit does kind of does some exploration in the background clever exploration based on feedback and feeds these models to do a better job in regions where we know we'll find higher click rates or higher higher conversion rates for instance i'm not going to go through so these are again some of my collaborators uh, as you can see it's uh, as you can see i work double shift right india and us <laughs> and uh, we have a wonderful intern visiting us this summer andrew cron so and uh, i would like to thank our lead senior leadership uh, for all the support they provided us throughout these different projects i talked about okay so thank you Thank you Deepak for the very interesting and enlightening talk. Uh with that we open the floor for questions. Please use the mic or I could walk around and hand over the mic. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions. Uh one is uh, how is the back off estimate different than the Gini index um that that's used for uh, choosing the right attribute for splitting and decision tree problem because over there also we're looking for homogeneity homogeneity. Yeah so so the question was uh, how is the back off estimate which i talked about different from uh, 
using something like a Gini's index splitting criteria to build decision trees. So, the Gini's index splitting criteria to build decision tree is meant to give you the structure. Right. Here I was assuming the structure is already given. Given that you already have the structure, how are you going to estimate your CTRs in a better way? So, imagine building a decision tree that is very, very big. Right. Right? Now, if you go to the leaf level, you have no data at all. So, right. how are you going to do the smoothing in that case? Right? So, if you, at the leaf level, you have 0 over 5, what are you going to do? And if you drop a new case, what's the CTR there? 0%, right. so right. that's not good. Right? So, maybe you'll say, okay, let me go to the next level in the decision tree and use that as my back-off estimate. So, that's right. one way to use the back-off estimate in decision trees. Okay. Uh, but again, decision tree is a tree. What I showed you was a digraph. So, the smoothing can also happen with respect to digraph. In the front page example, it can also happen through projections. Okay. Right? So, there are different ways of doing these back-offs, decision trees, digraphs, projections, and many more. Right? Okay. And that's the, that's the whole game in machine learning and statistics. Right, right. And do you add some sort of a penalty uh, while estimating the weights? to prevent overfitting because... Oh, I yeah, need, yeah. We right. add a lot of such. So, the question was, do we add penalties by estimating the weight? So, what I presented you was a very, very high overview of the method. The actual okay. method is quite complex. Okay. We use something called the spike and slap prior. So, right. we put a prior which says with probability 1, you're going to screen the variable off and with probability 1 minus p, you are going to sh smooth it towards some distribution. You get some posterior distribution and the posterior distribution has an inbuilt screening into it and smoothing. So, it's a, so if you want, you can read the paper. It's not inaccessible, okay. I would say, if you have a basic understanding of these things, but, okay. uh, but it has a lot of such things built into okay. it. Okay, and a last question on the CTR calculation. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's very likely that, you know, how much ever uh, popular an article is, um, after uh, viewing it the first time, a user might not come back for viewing it again because he, already, he or she already knows the story about it. So, when you calculate the CTR, um, once the user has viewed the page, shouldn't you decrease, um, you know, how much you add in the denominator for their views? Meaning, okay. you, right. So, you're talking about the first application? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, in the first application, when we are computing the CTRs, shouldn't we be discounting repeat views? Right. That's correct. But remember, I was telling you, we were computing the CTRs by using the random bucket. Right. In the random bucket, we randomize the article which I show to you. So, the repeat view is very small. There are not too many repeat views okay. in the random bucket. So, okay. that problem was not there. Okay. But you're absolutely right. If there are repeat views, it should be incorporated in the model. And one of the papers I talked about there, the WWW 2008, actually has a model which incorporates both the decay as well as the other things in, in, the, same, in, in the modeling framework. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. You said the new articles, you give them, or you start off with a high CTR. That was the first algorithm which did not work. Okay, but go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then how do you promote recent content in your existing So the algorithms? explore exploit will do that, right? So just consider the simple explore exploit scheme I described. With one, in 1% of the traffic, we randomly select an article, right? So if a new article comes in, in the randomization, let's say there are 5,000 views, uh, in expectation, and there are let's say 20 articles, every article is going to get like 5,000 by 20 views in expectation every five minutes. So, no article is starved if you go by that solution. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, I read a paper a while ago that used something called contextual bandits. I think that was also out of Yahoo. So, I'm not sure does that, because that also applied to the Yahoo Today front page. So, does that fit in here somewhere, or is that a separate approach? Yeah. So, uh, the contextual bandit, what it was doing was, uh, it was building a projection-based model at an art article level. And uh, it, was, it was presenting a particular explore-exploit algorithm. So what it was doing was, instead of choosing the article that has the maximum CTR, you choose an article with the maximum overestimate of a CTR. And the overestimate was given by the CTR plus two times standard deviation. Right? Yeah. So it's, it's a yet another explore-exploit scheme, as I said. I mean, there are many so others. They, they also had a hybrid model there, which, in which case, if you do not have sufficient data to build a separate model for each user, what you do is you aggregate. So does that tie into the back-off approach? You yeah, use? yeah, that's the back-off in that particular model. So is it like exactly the same? No, or? it's this model is more granular. The factor model I described can actually go up to the level of the user itself. In that paper, uh, the user is completely characterized by its features. 
And in many cases, that's okay, right? If most of your users come once or twice, then you cannot learn a per user model anyways. Uh, so don't you do an aggregation there? From what I remember, you do do an aggregation besides. Yeah, so we do do an aggregation. Let, let me go back to that slide. Okay, so this is what happens. So for a new user, the factor estimates are given by the projections, right? So for yeah. a new user, you will only know their features. And you'll say, okay, their factors are given by that projection matrix, which I've estimated by using a lot of old users. Yeah. Okay. As you start getting more and more data about the user, it moves away from that average, right? So this is the, this is the estimate which you get for a user when you're coming for the first time. It's entirely based on your features. As you start giving me more and more data, then I move away from this and do a linear combination of this and what you have done on the front page. Okay. And what happens is the more you do, this component becomes more dominant. This kind of washes out. Okay, so this is actually more flexible than Right. That. Yeah, thank you. We'd like to hear your experience in the utility function of the click, the utility of each click. Do you see a lot of, a lot of variance per user and need to personalize the calculation of the utility? And do you see any uh, dominance of the utility? For example, if the utility of news was 100 times the utility of sports, all the calculation of the probability would not be uh, relevant. Uh, that's a good question, so let me see. So we have multiple utilities. I'm trying to figure out which one I should tell you, which one I should not. I mean, that's, that's really the issue here. Yeah, so we do see a lot of variation in utilities across different Yahoo properties. And that is what we utilize in doing that. I mean, that's the main reason why we do see a big bump in downstream utility by losing a small CTR. It is there at the global level. It is also there at the user level. Uh, does that answer your question? I mean, I think uh, you, you're looking at more like quantification of how much it is. Um, so I, I don't have those numbers. Uh, the, the there, there is a variance. But, but uh, if, you, if you're looking at utility like time spent, that's what we tried. It's hard to predict that. Uh, if you're looking at something like revenue, advertising revenue, it's not hard to predict that. We know that. Um, but unfortunately, I cannot tell you more about that part. I can tell you about the first part where it's hard to predict. So I can't tell you more about anything. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you position the user and the article in the same Euclidean space? Is it more like uh, considering the article as a document and uh, all the articles viewed by the user is another document and then just doing a cosine or something? Uh, so that representation, represent, okay, so the question was how do we map the users and articles in the same latent space? So what do this latent space mean, right? So that representation was more a conceptual representation. Uh, I mean, what you're doing is you're assuming that the user has some latent tastes which we want to discover from the data. The item has some latent characteristics which we want to discover from the data. And you're positing that they could be all mapped to the same Euclidean space and you can measure the affinity through a Euclidean through a cosine of that. You write down that model, and then you try to figure out how to move the users and the items in this space until you have a very good fit to the data you have. Right? So that's how it is done. And at the end of the day, you get some estimate for every user and for every item. From a modeling perspective, it does a good job of prediction. Now, if you start interpreting, interpreting these factors, then it's not so easy. And we don't try to interpret those. Uh, uh, there are other models. If you want more interpretable representation, there are other models you could use. But Using those models may cost you accuracy. So it depends on what, what you really prefer more, accuracy or interpretability. So I, I think the, uh, great talk, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, and the question we have is basically, uh, in, in a LinkedIn scenario, a majority of the recommendation problems uh, that we encounter have, have an aspect of accuracy, not necessarily relevant. So with news or movies. Oh, say that again, has an aspect of? Aspect of accuracy. Okay, okay. Um, not necessarily uh, relevant. Okay. I mean, they're sort of related, but I'll get to the distinction in a minute probably. Um, so the, the aspect of it with movies uh, and news is that, okay, well, it's relevant, I kind of like it, I'll click on it or maybe convert and so on and so forth. So we have a particular use case where it's job recommendations, for instance, right? So in that scenario, what happens is that 
it's it's not necessarily relevant. It has to be sort of accurate in the sense that it has to fit my profile, my seniority level, and so on and so forth. Now, have you had an experience with, with this kind of a problem where the accuracy is, is, I mean, you're trying to model for accuracy, not necessarily just for the conversion. Conversion is obviously one thing that you're after. But um, it's, it's, it's a far, far more granular problem. Uh, and, and the clicks that you observe are not that many. So your observations are quite low. Um, but the accuracy that you're trying to achieve is very high. Um, and, and if you have any insights on how to attack those problems from a statistical perspective, that will be. Uh, OK, so I don't have insights on how to attack it from a statistical okay. perspective. Right. But we also encounter such issues. So for instance, uh, I briefly mentioned it for the front page application. So I was saying that uh, we try to show the most popular articles subject to constraints. And some of these constraints are diversity constraints. Uh, some of them are voice constraints. So the voice constraint may say, well, don't show too many sports articles this quarter. Uh, because that may be indirectly related to our advertising revenue and so on and so forth. So the way we solve it in the front page scenario is we take a two-phase approach. The set of articles or the content inventory which is presented to the statistical al algorithm has already been curated through editorial oversight. And then the algorithm does the best job on top of this. So in your case, for instance, if a user comes in and he has a particular qualification, you can first say, okay, out of all my 10,000 ads, I'm going to narrow down to a set that is appropriate to this particular user based on what they want. And then you do a ranking on top of that. In the case of advertising, advertisers do that automatically. They specify targeting constraints a priori. And, uh, and then, then you select, you thin down your ads based on that. And then you surf the best CTR article out of that pool. So, so far, we have been doing this two-phase approach. But I believe your question is, uh, can we do it in a more coherent way? And I, I don't have a good answer for that. I think uh, uh, right now, that's more application dependent for me. But uh, you know, that's, something, uh, that's something challenging to think about in the future. Well, so thanks for that. I think that's the insight I was looking for, basically, that the two-phase approach does make sense, and there's no magic silo bullet that no, there can is solve no magic and model solution. the problem. And the reason I'll tell you that, why, the re why it's so. Click rate are only giving you some proxy of what you want to achieve in the long run. If I show a Britney Spears article, I'll, I keep re using re Britney Spears, so I apologize for that, but that's a good example. So if I keep showing Britney Spears a, lo a lot of times, I'll get a huge click rate in the short term, and my metrics might look very good. But in the long run, it may not be good for you. And we in the sciences don't have a good method so far of measuring what a long-term impact would be of something we do today. Right? So in the absence of that, we kind of go with editorial oversight, business oversight, and make sure that these constraints are there in the system and we're not doing something stupid, uh, where we kind of reach a point of no return and the users all go away from you. So, so I had one follow-up question. Was, so you mentioned you should train, retrain your models uh, ever so frequently. And, and oh, so you said five minutes, maybe. So five minutes. Uh, is so that just was a for a coarse model. Like if you're using very granular models, it may or may not be necessary, depending on how dynamic your system is. Uh, and and how do you characterize dynamic? That's that's the real question. Basically, when do you say it's time to retrain? So it? in this example, uh, in the front page example, when we are looking at data at very coarse resolution, you saw the CTRs were kind of changing. And that was clearly dynamic, right? If, if I don't update the model every five minutes, then the, we are going to miss the dynamics. Moreover, the article had short lifetimes. An article will be there in the system for 12 hours, and then it's gone, right? And so if the Michael Jackson article is there, you have to latch on to that very quickly. Otherwise, people are going to get that news somewhere else on the web, like CNN. And they may have a negative experience about Yahoo. In the ads scenario, the ads may be more stable, especially if you're looking at models at very granular level, right? What does this ad do on this particular publisher for this kind of user? that dynamic may not change very quickly. Uh, at least in the advertising, it looks like that's the case. But uh, there is still some dynamic component there. And if you can afford to build a fast update loop, uh, it costs engineering dollars. But it's always good. Uh, 
So it depends on your application. But in general, I've seen if you have very granular models and with good backoffs based on features that don't change over time dramatically, it's not so critical to update every five minutes, maybe every 30 minutes, every hour. Uh, but otherwise, you, you may have to update it faster. Thank you. No problem. I noticed that you uh, briefly mentioned advertising uh, recommendation, right? So yeah. uh, I think in advertising, uh, I think engagement is a hot topic now. So instead of just a click-through rate, you know, people play, like, for example, we have a rich media ads, right? People play video, listen to sound, you know, mouse hover, you know, some, some interesting, you know, images, things like that. So I think, do you think that because of this, it makes uh, advertising recommendation more difficult than news uh, recommendation? Uh, or what is the you know, biggest difference between ads recommendation and news recommendation? And what is the biggest challenge? The biggest difference is click rates are abysmally low in advertising <laughs> and in news, right? So uh -huh. if you come to the news site, then you're uh -huh. probably coming to the news site to consume news. And uh, ads are kind of more of an after thought, right? Some people, some people don't even look at ads. Others look at ads, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, but so the, if, if they, you know, because nowadays is you know a rich media provide a way for people to interact with ads, not just a click. You know. okay. So, so you're more saying metrics to track to, to to build into your model. Do you think that? So, so you're saying rich media enhances uh, the click rate on ad. That's not. Yeah, true, probably right? lead to you know conversion. Okay, so the holy grail is there should be no difference between ads and content, right? The content should kind of completely mesh with the con. The ad should mesh with the content in a way people should not even think of them as inseparable entities, and they should just click on the ads more often, and we'll make more money. But unfortunately, that never happened. That's that has not happened so far. And if what you're saying does happen, then you know I think uh, we'll be happier to. Yeah, it's because an yeah, problem. yeah, absolutely. I, I, because I noticed that you know some uh, you know uh, companies say okay, uh, because of this you know rich media ads, e engagement in, you know increase like ten times, so that will lead you know higher conversion rate. So that's oh, what, that's why. good. I mean, that, yeah, then, yeah, that, I think actually, probably yeah. yeah. So, so the so, statistical problem, uh, the more clicks you get, I think uh, it gets better. Mm -hmm. Unless you are introducing ads that are very diverse kinds than what you have in the pool today, right? Because the more diversity you introduce, the more clicks you will need to learn that diversity. So it's a kind, it's a trade-off between how much diversity you are introducing and how much clicks, additional clicks you are getting. And it's not very easy to quantify that until we look, unless we look at the data very carefully. Like if I look at the data which you are talking about, then maybe I can provide some insight. Yeah, but yeah, I have not yeah. looked at that data. Okay, so can you share some like high? you know, level overview of uh, Yahoo research on advertising, because you mentioned that you will share that maybe in the future, or <laughs> no? <laughs> well, maybe I can talk to you offline. Uh, uh, okay. okay. Because the yeah. overview is uh, quite long. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we have a lot of people in advertising. <laughs> do, do, do you have a paper on uh, advertising recommendations? Oh, stuff? yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. we, okay. we, have, we have a big organization on advertising, yeah. okay. so. I don't want to describe 100 people's work in two yeah, seconds. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> not doing yeah. justice to that. Thanks. So I think we'll take one more brief question. Chandran had a question, and then and we'll wrap up. And Hi, I was have thinking some about uh, article personalization, let's say, on my Yahoo. Uh, in the front page, maybe you have curated content, which maybe you have 1,000 articles or something. Then an algorithm can optimize the selection of them, right? When you have real personalization, every user, uh, if you just have these 1,000 articles, uh, most users will not be interested in any of these thousand, right? So you don't have this pre-filtering, this two-phase approach may not be feasible. In that case, how do you begin? How do you get probability estimates for individual articles when the number of possibilities is like, you know, I'm sure on a daily basis, Yahoo gets like maybe several tens of thousands of articles coming in. Yeah, so what I want to see as a my Yahoo user is among all these tens of thousands, I want the ones just personalized to me. Right, so that's a very good question and a difficult problem. And I think any, this year we are focusing a lot. Any progress yeah, so the, yeah. the general met methodology is something similar to what I described in this picture. Right, so we build offline models. Right, so the offline models kind of, these offline models provide a good initialization to new things that come in, right? So for instance, if you know that sports article don't go well with these users, you can immediately exclude a branch of articles from the recommended pool and then only focus on the ones which the user is interested in. So this means your, uh, the 
clustering the users in some yeah, manner. Yeah, clustering the users. So that's the game we have to play. You have to take this high dimensional problem and reduce the dimension of the problem. And again, the explore expert algorithms also have to change to kind of figure out at a high level, this is what I like in general, this is something which I don't like in general. Then you cut down the branches completely rather than cutting down articles. Right? Okay. But this is something which is research in progress, so I don't have anything very brief and concise to say right now, but that's the general approach we are taking. Okay, it's, it's still sort of like your back of algorithm. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. Where you are putting a hierarchy on right, the users right, right, and right. then using that to trim. But them. how to mesh, explore, exploit with that in a clever way, that's actually, yeah, that, that, that's because actually. Because if you put too many articles for me yeah. that, that I don't like. You cannot show every article to every user. Yeah. Let's put it that way. That's not possible. Yeah. So you have to do something intelligent. And the back of models provide you a clue on how to do that. Okay. But then you have to do something more clever on how to explore these things in a better way. To because what I feel is the cost of putting a bad article in front of a user oh, yes. and you claim it's personalized yes. is really very high. That's right, that's right. right. So the metrics also play a role there. Just It's not just the not click thing, it's just the user experience which is going to even, work. Yeah, you know. even the view itself is. Right, is so it's a very difficult problem. I mean, the way you're yeah. describing it is difficult. So. Yeah. I'm sure uh, that's what you're That's That's what we are working on, yeah. But, but I, I, don't, I don't think we have a very good answer right now. I think uh, the more insightful answer maybe in future years. Thank you. thank you. Just uh, thank you so much. Our no old friend Deepak from Yahoo, great to see you, man. Thanks for coming in.